Check, Carly, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? I can. Oh, well, I just me? did a Google time zones again, just out of sheer panic. <laughs> you feel okay for sharing? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm okay. not uh, the host yet, but I'm sure someone will pop in and swip swap that over. That would be um, me. Hi. Oh, hi there. Hello. Okay, I'll make, you're both going to be co host? Sure. Okay. There we go. And there we go. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Rolling. All right. Let me practice a screen share here. Does that look good, Jen? It does, Carly. All right. I can just leave that up and then people will see it when they come in uh -huh. and we have no video to test or anything like that. And then no, I will just put the Jamboard link into the chat um, when people come in so that they can hop on there. Let me just see, are we supposed to record? Oh, good question. Jennifer, are we to other Jennifer, Jennifer too? Are we to record this session or? It's automatically being recorded. Wow. Yeah, they set right. it up to start right away. Cause I think last year, a lot of people forgot, myself included. Yes. A lot yes. of the moderators forgot to hit record. So they just set it up to start immediately. How are things been going from your perspective? Great. Yeah, yeah. it's been really good, really smooth. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind doing a conference this way to be honest with you. Because I live on Vancouver Island and most of the time we have to travel to Vancouver for conferences and you know it's great to mingle and mix and see all the people but it is a bit of an ordeal getting there so it is kind of nice actually to be sitting here in my track pants. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to travel to Vancouver Island. It's really nice yeah I'm pretty lucky. Um, my parents decided to move here in 1975 and build a house on a piece of property. And now I live on the property next door to them. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty lucky. Where are you guys? Landlocked in Southwestern Ontario. Uh, we're about okay. an hour and 15 minutes west of Toronto. Okay. My the husband's town's... from Oshawa, so. Uh, it's called I've Kitchener Waterloo. Okay, yeah. Yeah, not too far from the Oshawa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure you've been reading about Ontario in the news. We're not very <laughs> popular so right now. There at the moment. Yeah. I have. I mean, BC's not doing awesome either. But Vancouver Island, actually, I think because we're a bit isolated, we've actually done fairly well. I don't want to jinx it, but um, we haven't had a ton of cases here. Mm hmm. So we've been lucky I, that way. I read something that called us the Florida of Canada. And oh, thought, no. oh, no. No, that's, <laughs> not, no. that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> no. And no. In, at least in Florida, they're like out partying. We're like inside and we're still <laughs> like, it's not good. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm on the, I've registered for a vaccine. So hopefully in the next month, I should be getting my vaccine yeah we are at that point too like um if you're 40 plus and an ed and or an educator you can now be mm. you know what we're still in a pre-registered state so yeah hopefully same. hopefully four to six weeks yeah that's what i'm yeah. thinking yeah time we got here oh six more minutes so have you guys done seen any of the other presentations or are you just popping in for this 
couple. I haven't had a ton of time on my calendar, but I was talking to my colleague that went to quite a few and has been enjoying it. Yeah. I have not got to do any. I have another full day of right. meetings, so, but it's okay. Yeah. Really like Tony Bates this morning, he always does a great job of getting to the heart of really what we need to work on in mm -hmm. distance learning. Oh, that's cool. Was he a keynote? Yeah. Yeah. He's been coming like for many years. Keynote as well. It was inspiring. George what did he tell What do you? Yeah, George is good. What did Tony touch on as the most imperative? Oh, he, he just talked about the whole structure thing. So he, one of the things he brought up was what we see is not what students see, just because of bandwidth issues and because of the technology issues. Mm. Um, talked about the, you know, the need for thinking of the different media having different strengths. And so if we're doing online stuff, um, that will have certain strengths, face-to-face -face will have certain strengths. And so when we're delivering, we want to focus our what we're trying to teach on the strengths of the particular media. Um, so if you're like when we did the pandemic get away from school last year, and I know Ontario is doing that now, um, we didn't tap on our experts in distance learning to help us make that transition. We just, you know, whatever we thought was the right thing we did, mm -hmm. um, rather than being more intentional about how we changed our, uh, what we were trying to deliver based on the new media we were using to deliver it. So many people tried to do the same thing in the different space because that was all they knew, right? Hmm. Yeah. Now, do you see my video? Your no, black you, screen, but yeah, the, yeah, that's what I see too, and I'm going. I don't know why. In the lower left, did you do you have an option to start video? Is there a little yeah, red yeah, line? Yeah, I did. I did start video. If I turn it off, you'll see my name show up. Mm hmm. True. Um, but when I turn on, it's black, and it's like, okay, do I cover it with something? No, there's nothing over the camera. I'm gonna say it's, it's almost like you have your lens earlier. cap on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, oh, weird. Not like I'm presenting or anything and I need to be seen, so I'm not too worried about it, but I'm just wondering. Hmm. I run out of tech tips pretty quickly. <laughs>
Oh, well. The other thing that I found really interesting was yesterday, um, the principles of learning talk, and then looking at um, the new model from the ministry and how they're approaching um, distance learning. Mm. And looking at um, how the different pieces are going to integrate in the new the new model in terms of school districts and uh, the ministry and looking at quality control in, in distance learning. In Ontario, Ian? No, this is BC. Yeah, we have a similar implementation coming. We're, uh, they talked about it last year and then we, they were gonna end all the contracts in May, like now, and they've extended them for another year, so. Mm. At the moment, we have 50-some distance learning schools in the province, and I think they're planning to go down to about five or six. Should we get started, Carly? Yeah, yeah I'm just say it's 11.31, so um, I've just put the link to the shared doc if anybody wants to add anything to it into the chat there, and I will hand it over to Carly and Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to our presentation today. A uh, little bit of presentation, a little bit of back and forth and interaction. As Jen said in the chat, this is a nice small group, so hopefully you will... Uh, indulge us and engage in some of the conversation around our topic today, which is creating community in a disruption. So uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Jennifer and I gather today in Waterloo Region, Ontario, is the land traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We also acknowledge that as we come together today while staying apart, you may be gathering on other traditional lands from around our region and from around our country. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. Thanks, Carly. Um, so, and what's important about that image on that previous slide is that was um, a commissioned artwork from the Anishinaabe community in Ontario um, and the Ontario College of Teachers did some work to represent our practices um, and our um, ethics standards of ethics in um, these beautiful artworks. So we're very grateful for that. So my name is Jennifer Shortreed. I am a system administrator, meaning I'm an experienced principal who's been hired to work centrally on behalf of, in my case, all of our 16 secondary high schools. Um, I'm also got made the uh, uh, principal of distance learning and um, e-learning once the pandemic hit. Um, so that is me, Carly. And I'm Carly Parsons and I am a vice principal here in the Waterloo region. Uh, so I am currently at a school where we uh, here in Ontario are uh, running hybrid learning. So that means some of our students learn from home and some are in the building and then they switch. But as you may or may not know from the news, uh, our entire province is in a lockdown right now. So all of our students are learning from home at the moment. And I was lucky enough before Jen was scooped up by the board to work under Jen. Uh, Jen was my principal and I've been lucky enough to continue some work with her at the system level. So that's what brings us both here today to um, meet with you all. So here's our agenda for the day uh, or for the session. We only have 45 minutes with you good people. So we're looking at the Ontario context of disruption, which is probably quite similar to uh, everyone else's uh, context of disruption across the country. Uh, then we thought we would talk a little bit about the challenges um, of creating things that don't exist. And then from there, looking at opportunities uh, in creating community and then a final reflection where we can come together and kind of share some best practices and things that we hope will continue on. So uh, just in the interest of the 45 minutes we have, if there was something in here that really resonates with you right off the hop, like if you'd rather spend more time talking about challenges versus opportunities uh, or, or vice versa, if you wanna just throw that uh, into the chat and that will help um, 
Jen and I kind of uh, decide where we spend a little bit more time as we go. Uh, and I'll kind of monitor that as we move along. Thanks, Carly. And the Ontario context um, is important to outline briefly as it can kind of create a vision of what our disruption has been. Obviously, globally, we're in a pandemic, but so you understand the specific parameters for us, um, I thought it worth just a second year time to outline those. So in March 2020, we moved to fully remote learning right through until June graduation dates last year. Um, from June to August, we were then required to plan for a variety of programs, everything from full distance learning to completely full in-person learning and a variety of things in between those two realities over those months. Uh, when September hit, it turned out that we would be in two models in secondary where Carly and I work, um, either you could choose to be fully remote synchronous learning, or you could be in person in a cohorted hybrid model. So in our cohort hybrid system here in Ontario, we have a blended learning model with 15 students in person with a teacher for a set number of days, usually five days at a time, then they flip and they go to their homes and the group that was at home comes in person. So while you're at home learning in the hybrid in-person model, you're working from a blended learning um, virtual platform that your teacher set up for you, which is a blend of synchronous and asynchronous uh, materials. We also had to accommodate multiple opportunities to switch those modes of learning. So a family could move from in-person to remote or remote to in-person. So for example, in distance learning where I am the principal of that program, we started with 2,200 students and we're currently in quad four, which we just started with 4,600 students at this point. Um, and we've had close to um, 800 teachers pass through the program with um, over 750 sections at, at between quad three and quad four. So it's kind of a crazy context, but I'm happy to report that despite these, these um, sheer scale and size of this disruption, that we have managed to create something really special, especially in our fully remote distance learning environment of a really engaged learning community amongst our teachers, which I think has led to um, community-based classrooms and different outcomes for kids. So in terms of challenges, I'll be brief here because it looks like we're mostly interested in community and opportunities. I'll just say there were a lot of them. <laughs> Most had to do with the sheer scale and speed of moving an entire body of 23,000 learners to completely new instructional programs um, that literally didn't exist and radically new in different timetables. So in our perp our previous um, versions in our school board of virtual learning, we only had asynchronous e-learning. We had no synchronous opportunity learning um, programs. Uh, so we had no way to effectively schedule students even to this kind of, of program. And we didn't have a common learning management system or even common vocabulary to use. Um, so we have two platforms that we use, D2L, Brightspace and Google Classroom. We support both. Um, but teachers could therefore use both. So there you have, you could have a complete discrepancy. We also had to move to quadmesters. I mean, my computer still doesn't even know how to spell quadmester. So that shows you how new that is. And it, all of that had to be developed. Assessment also undersaw a radical shift, I think for the better. That's the whole point of the community piece is we want to leverage these good changes um, where the sheer um, challenges to the virtual environment meant the ministry mandated that you move to 100% term evaluation versus uh, a split with a final evaluation exam model. So Carly and I thought we'd take a quick minute. Do we still want to do that, Carly, or we want to change? Well, that? I've put I've put the um, link in the chat for a Jamboard. So you're welcome to pop in there. We uh, won't project it for you, but I can come back to it and pull some of the topics when we get into our a uh, little round table at the end. So if you want to pop into that Jamboard that's in the comments and just leave any major challenges you face, but more importantly, as this group has said, the opportunities for um, creating community and for our students in blue, uh, you can do that as we um, continue through with the information. So moving on then, Carly? Yes, you are. Sorry, Jen. Up there now. <laughs> <laughs> I love that's what my autocorrect is to Amanda quad master and if I don't catch it it's just so embarrassing. <laughs> um, so 
I think the opportunities, I've done my best on this slide to capture the ones that are most important for me in where I think we've been extremely successful at creating conditions for community. And I would not suggest as I'm impacting some um, over 700 educators that I am have handled this um, bang on the nose properly exactly the way that works for them for every single one. But overall, I think we have made this work. And I think if you're going to leverage change and, and make the positive changes that have been forced out of a huge disruption, and I think after the pandemic, it might be something like a big change implementation that you're going through as a school or a school board or a region. But if we're going to leverage change out of disruption and really make it sustainable and carry on after that, that um, compliance and, and deep intense work that people are doing, you have to create the conditions for that to feel good and for it to feel relationship based. People have to feel like it was worth it and it was worthwhile and therefore they want to keep doing it. Um, so I tried to capture on here the things that were most important to me. Some things just never go away and people I put them in front of people over and over and over again and that starts to create that common vocabulary trauma informed was one of those things for us where we talked about things being predictable but flexible routines um, but differentiated if the routine needed to change based on someone's needs that's what we were going to do um, the relationships humanize everything that moves and connects to people is the most important work I'm very good at logistics and op operations and setting up supports and structures for people to really um, learn as a team and as a community. But I think I underestimated and the disruption has allowed me at this late stage in my career to really understand how important that relationship and human centered piece is. Um, if you don't come at it from a position of empathy and what would I want if I was in their shoes, you are missing the opportunity in from my point of view. So those have become extremely um, important to me. And I think permissions and joy, I'll just briefly talk to those Carly. When you are creating a community, communities celebrate their joy and pain together. You have to celebrate the good things and you have to express and validate the bad things. When things are really tough in a disruption and we try to be overly optimistic, um, what my staff started to call toxic positivity, it's not helpful. I mean, you're going to be red in that room and it, in the worst case, you're going to alienate people because they're going through such a state of overwhelmed um, that if you talk in global gratitudes, it doesn't hit home it, and it, you can actually turn people off. So if you're going to create the conditions of community and you want to really um, give people the opportunity to feel a part of it. This joy and pain are really closely interconnected and very, very important for what I think we got right. So if you want to praise people for what they're doing, because it's pretty tremendous, it's got to be the same as in the classroom, very specific, very targeted and feel very true. So we're not just going to randomly say you guys are doing a great job. You're the wind beneath my wings. We're going to say, I, someone sent me a video this week. I'm going to play it for you. Someone told me a story about a kid this week. I'm going to tell you what they did that really, you know, made a difference for kids and really personalize it. Be specific about what worked, why it worked and how we're going to do it. And when things go bad, like really bad and we're in a horrible time, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to show you I'm right there with you. I get it. It's not good, but at least we have each other. And at least together we're trying a new thing and at least together we're coming to our, with our next best step and let's now go into a group and a team and do that next best step. So I think those kind of human authentic approaches are really, really important out of these um, this list. So humanize everything. Let's talk a little bit more about this. There's sort of two categories of people. I'm going to speak to one and Carly's going to speak to the other. The first is people that feel it and then they can think their way into doing it. Um, and those people need me to be real. They need me to connect with them. They need it to feel authentic, vulnerable. They need to think I have a vision. And my vision can be super global. And in fact, in a massive disruption, it should be. So my vision is something like, um, I need us all to have our kids feel welcome in our classrooms. I don't care if you're in a hybrid classroom or in-person classroom um, or you're vir fully virtual, the kids have to feel like they're welcome there. If they're parachuting in after five days of being away because someone in their house is sick, then I need them to feel like, wow, they're so grateful I'm here and there's no expectation other than I'm here and I'm doing the best I can do today. 
So that's what I mean by vision. And I want to just be super clear with people what I believe and what I value and what we're all working together on versus previous times when I might say I want a 25% increase in engagement by measuring such and such. It's really like those human empathy based vision statements. And then they want so they want to attach to the vision, the belief and the trust, which is you get by being real authentic and vulnerable. And then you want to attach them to a team. These people don't need me to show them anything, nor do I have time to do it. Um, Andrew Bronsky is in the room. He's one of my go to consultants. Um, I they're going to they just need me to connect to somebody like Andrew Bronsky. They need us to leave them alone and let them do the work that we've just freed them to do, that we've just given them permission to cut back on their curriculum, quality over quantity, assess products um, less than you would in the past, give value to observations and conversations. Don't be afraid to attach a mark to an observation and conversation. Now they want me to leave them alone and do it. So we've done that with a variety of entry points, which really has been the key that I can come into my learning in a variety of ways. I can do one-on-one -on -one drop in. I can do a watch and learn webinar. I can tell you what webinar I want you to run and then you run it. Um, and I can do just in time bite-sized learning. And I strongly urge if you're in the slideshow, you click on that. There's fabulous resources on the bite-sized learning website that our consultants have developed. And there's only a few of us. <laughs> there's three main consultants touching this work and they generated that along with the help of the teachers that were actively engaged. So this village just needs me to connect them to each other and let them go. So Carly's gonna speak to another kind of community learner that we think of. Yeah, so Jen did a great job of, of explaining that um, that feeling person and that that staff member or teacher that needs that emotional connection to be able to propel forward. But we all know that there is the other side of the people who need to do the work before they are convinced and that they act their way into the thinking or into the belief. So uh, how do you do this? And, and I can say, uh, being two doors down from one of our uh, distance learning VPs, that I was able to watch the distance learning program create this space for those more cerebral um, teachers uh, who needed it that really provided them with everything they needed to think their way into action. So first and foremost, what are the rules? So you can see there that little bin. Uh, I am, I, I somehow drew the very short straw of being the health and safety vice principal uh, this year at my site, which meant that I was in charge of laying down all the arrows on the floors at 11 p.m. in August on a Friday night to get them ready and making sure that our PPE is all in place and our counts. And I thought to myself in September, or as I approached September, you know, what, what are the people coming into this site really going to need? And what they're going to need is everything they need in front of them in one space. So I made these little bins full of all of their PPE and some gum for that mask, mask, mask breath that we all know so well now and are so used to, and a toolkit, essentially. And that's what you need to create as well for your staff and for your teachers. And that is why I believe when I look at the success of the distance learning program in the WRDSB, that's why I believe it was successful because that those rules were there and laid out in a way that was so accessible and manageable. So all of the key procedures and clear steps laid out and trying to get ahead of all of the changes. So being able to anticipate the needs of those staff members um, and making sure that the calendars, the guides and the instructional videos were all available. Um, and then the second point here is where will I get the help? So one thing that we realized when we went through um, this past year, both in hybrid and in distance learning is that having an authority or expert. So Jen talked about Andrew, who I know is in here. Uh, and unfortunately for Andrew, he is the expert on all things D2L, which is our platform. So having that touch point for staff to know this is your person, or perhaps finding someone in the school who's maybe just as good so that Andrew doesn't get a thousand emails a day, but just who is that expert that you can go to and they say, you know what, I've done this, let me help you, is a huge um, way to create those connections and to continue to build that autonomy for your staff. Um, so holding consult, um, consult drop-ins where staff can just drop in on any number of subjects. So AER, you know, marks, um, technical things in D2L, creating, you know, a more engaging 
digital classroom. Drop-ins are happening all the time for all of our staff across the board. Uh, some are, are um, really widely attended and some are just four or five people. And, and even in those situations, you get a really great feel and that ability to talk things through. Um, webinars are also a really big thing that we've embraced here in our board is recording so that you have that just in time availability for um, learning that you might need. And then the last part is making it easy to find. So I think anyone here in admin uh, in our board has now become graphic designers, um, creating hyperdocs, uh, where all of the information is housed in one place, because we are not in a building anymore. We can't gather and, and uh, all be together for us to hand out papers. Everything is virtual. So being able to find that in a hyperdoc uh, is really important for those people who are the thinkers, knowing where they can click uh, to find what they need has been um, also really imperative in creating almost like a virtual office space where everything is in the right drawer. Jen, I don't know if I missed anything in there that you want to touch on before we go to our kind of our conversation piece. No, I would say one thing I've observed in as my business as an administrator over the past 15 years has been in leading people that I have um, seen reinforced from the research is those, fo those folks that don't need you so much other than to trust you and to know you're there for them and you've got their back if they kind of try something new and different in the from the uh, the first slide, they're going to kind of be your early adopters and your folks that are just need a few supports and they're, they're going to do it and keep the sustain the practices. These folks that come in as they have to act their way into thinking, they're the ones that I can really achieve change in education through. If I can get them not only to try it because they had to because of the pandemic, but to try it like it have made a few new friends along the way and had their efforts rewarded in a way they haven't ever felt before, like they are going to now sustain that practice. And now I've got close to like 75 or 80% of my teachers moving towards a type of education that I thought would take a decade to develop. So it's just so worth the investment of time right now. Um, we're looking like our next year is gonna be disrupted as well, um, which is a bit of a gift in a stinky sandwich, like in a stinky package, because we can maybe keep edging towards a sustainable change for those people that have to keep trying the practice in order to start believing in the practice. I knew there was a reason that I gave you the last word there for that section. So what's next and what does this mean? And you'll see there on the bottom, I have opportunities sponsored by the pandemic. And that's really what we are doing here in our board is we are trying to harness all of the opportunities that have come out of this great disruption and try and propel those forward. And as Jen said, like we are looking at a compressed timeline of, of things that we never thought possible. And we were just forced to do them in a very short uh, amount of time. So what we'd like to do now, we're not gonna put you in breakout rooms because there are only 15 of us in the room, but we'd love if um, you'd be willing to either A, put, put a comment in the chat or B, um, unmute in, and share with us and engage. We have another, um, I think 15, 20 minutes left in uh, two questions. What is one big success that you've had this year in your school in building community? And then number two, what will you carry over with you into next year? Or what do you hope sustains as we move into uh, this next phase of our pandemic learning? So, um, the floor is open. I see uh, Amanda is brave and willing to go first. I'm going to turn off my camera, though, not because I'm nervous, but my daughter's in a French meeting. And so I think my internet is not doing not so good. Um, I think in our asynchronous e-learning program up here in Ottawa, um, the biggest change for us has been offering uh, flexible delivery in terms of semestered courses. So students can start when they kind of want and finish when they kind of want. Um, and that's been huge uh, to build community and uh, for educators to think of their students as 
humans and think about their specific individual circumstances. Um, and so uh, we are hoping that the pandemic will subside, but this might be something that we continue even past this year, even though it is operationally a nightmare at this point. <laughs> I love that so much, Amanda, because I feel like I've been repeating that point over and over again this year that before and as, as a VP, a, part, a huge part of my job is attendance and this mentality of butts and seats. But now if we see that a student has handed something in at three in the morning, we're like, yes, thank you for handing that work in at 3 a.m try and do it at 2.30 a.m. tomorrow, and we're so proud of you. And it, it's been a complete rethinking of that time uh, piece, and really by applying that trauma-informed lens, we are really humanizing our students, that there are a lot of things going on in their life, and so we just need to celebrate those small wins of that work actually coming in or them logging in maybe half an hour later, but we're so glad they're here. So thanks for that. Yeah, this is a residual one for me too, that I hope the residue sticks, um, is that I had equated attendance with engagement in a lot of ways. And the pandemic has totally shifted that for me. Like I think of engagement much more broadly now. And I think it values kids who were undervalued by, by that previous metric. So I'm really excited to see where that could go. I'm curious about Kristen's comment about not feeling successful. I, 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 I let's, Kristen, are you willing to unmute and just let's probe that a bit? Tell us a bit what, what you're thinking. Um, in past years, I've had more success because students could be here. Our school, uh, we are a DL school in Nanaimo. Um, we had more of a blended approach. We'd have students in working on a regular basis. And there was quite a good community of students that were here just engaging with the staff. We've really limited who can come in this year due to COVID, obviously. Um, and so we don't get those interactions we were getting in person. Um, and I've tried online webinars and stuff. Students just don't show up. Um, but our, our clientele tends to be the anxious students that don't want to engage as it is. Um, so it's been an ongoing struggle trying to figure out how to build community in our DL school with the clientele we have. But as I said, one successful thing was online games club that a few, few teachers ran. They've always had a board games club going, but we've had students join that wouldn't have joined in person. So we're, it's trying to find a some things when we have time is the problem. So yeah, time I think is that's the yeah, I think that's a really common experience. And and the teachers that have, have had the best success in our program have, have been looking for again like what your games club might be doing for kids, new entry points that aren't traditional like camera on, unmute. I'm in your I'm in your meet doing stuff. Like giving them other opportunities through discussion threads, assign topics, develop a slide, um, expressing uh, through project-based learning. That's been hugely successful in the virtual environment where the student explores their interests and can express how, choose how they're going to perform or present. Um, they could, we had somebody share um, where kids had mashed together different sound uh, sounds and then written about what the sounds meant. So you know, it, it there requires a creativity and I encourage you to find your people that will help you explore those creative ideas for engagement because it, it takes intentional work. I will. And we know it takes intentional work. Unfortunately, this year, our school exploded. Like yeah. four to four times normal in our K to seven and probably triple in eight to 12. Um, and we were not staffed for that. And it took a lot of work to get extra staff. And so we have, and we have cross enrolled students, a lot of those. So it's been a interesting balance this year of trying to get, pay attention to our full-timers as well as our cross enrolled. 
and we're looking at ways that we can move forward and engage our full timers more. But it's right now it requires a lot of time to build that and we need to know our staffing for next year, which we don't. Yeah, and the, it's those unknowns that can just be such a uh, um we're banned from using the word pivot, but there's just those unknowns can be so dramatic. And yeah, the unknown of staffing is huge and the having to fight for staffing and, and feeling like we're just treading water um, for a good half, like till December. So like it, it's, we've just been too stressed to, to pay attention to our community, unfortunately. So we're looking for, I'm looking forward to starting off with that goal in mind this year when, and hopefully be prepared for the flood of students. Like hopefully our district staffs us for the flood of students we're going to get. I can hope. You can hope. We have to live in hope. That's right. And I hope so too. And I think that you'll be armed now with this year of experience to help you to better prepare. And, and I, I would suggest that uh, maybe the, even this kind of session where you're brainstorming when your staff does come in and you're doing, you know, um, a team building with your staff where you brainstorm challenges and opportunities. And then perhaps like Jen said, find those um, movers and shakers to help figure out different ways and kind of make it a whole team approach because when you can get that buy-in like i think they've created here in the disinserting program where they all do feel like they're part of a team working towards that common vision which continues to be restated is where you might see some great success there i'm um, just looking in the comments i really um love uh steph you said here that uh, another great thing that's happened is the time and space to build into the special education teams. And it is the first time that our EAs um, have had time to connect and problem solve together. I don't know if you wanted to talk to that or speak to that stuff at all, or if you're still uh, here. Yeah, sure, I can talk for just a second. Um, one of the unique things about how we've built our day this year is allowing our congregated um, students to leave and then actually building in part of the day um, at the end for that asynchronous or the synchronous opportunities for our students who are learning from home, but also for our teams to have time to connect and problem solve. And coming from a special education background, that was always a huge problem of practice because our EAs would only be scheduled for times when our, our kids were in the building. And so it's been such a blessing and such a unique opportunity to see the development of those teams. Um, and, and admin with those teams as well, as we've had that time and space to be able to connect with each other um, outside of when the students are here. So yeah, that was just a really neat byproduct and I hope something that is as seen as valuable as we move forward. Yeah, I love that. And so then the challenge becomes if you're thinking about structures in your future ideal world, how can you create that opportunity and I I think this is another residue for me Carly is this this idea that synchronous and asynchronous like the depth at which entire systems have really had to know what that is and how to deliver it means new opportunities for those uh, asynchronous chunks of learning time in a future timetable in a school can provide team time for the learners, uh, the adult learners. So I feel like this synchronous asynchronous is gonna be some sort of secret weapon, some little key to the kingdom from structures that we were previously unable to create in our traditional high schools and secondary schools um, across North America. So I'm excited to see where that's gonna go. And I'm, I'm trying to purposely build towards that through another year of, of disruption. Anyone else who has some thoughts to share with the room? There's a good one in here, Jen, that you'll like to hear. Uh, this is another fully online 90% asynchronous school that's doing regular monthly online assemblies, which has done a lot. So Jason, I don't know if you want, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so eBus Academy has been around for a long time and uh, been fully DL. Uh, we serve the you know, we have students from the entire province. So uh, 
we there's no blended or anything like that with us uh we do v classes that give us our synch synchronous time but they're uh mostly by choice and, and you know topic based um so lots of people doing lots of different things kind of on their own and uh so yeah as, as an admin team this year we decided to do um regular school assemblies like our brick and mortar schools do and um the buy-in has been pretty big um you know most things that we try you, you get 20 30 percent buy-in but we're we're getting i would you know haven't dug fully into the numbers but uh we're getting 60 to 75 percent of our students showing up to these um assemblies and uh you know it just gives us a chance to talk about some school-wide opportunities and uh you know build some little activities uh that come you know come from the admin so it's really good um, so people are wondering what platform you use, and I'm wondering, Jason, if you have student-generated content in your assemblies. Totally. So um, we, you know, every year we have a theme, um, and so we we do share a lot of the student-generated uh, uh, content that way. Uh, we this year have a student council that's been leading some of them, which is huge. Um, yeah, we're we're K to twelve with adult learners, so um we uh yeah some some assemblies we separate out for you know primary or intermediate or middle years in high school and sometimes it's full school uh we can't use collaborate because we don't have the ultimate edition and we started using collaborate but then we had too many participants so <laughs> uh we actually were a, a teams um, or a microsoft district so we're using microsoft teams to do it um and really happy with a lot of the development that's happened on the uh the the you know the different features that teams are starting to offer to make it much better so yeah but we have we do use collaborate as well <laughs> thanks jason uh i think uh i think all of these platforms i google google meet keeps coming out with new stuff now every month so they're really pivoting to with that dirty word again uh one question in here that i thought was interesting um and that maybe we could give our last little bit of time to cynthia asked uh she'd be interested in hearing ideas for asynchronous community building and student engagement outside of lms systems yeah me too i will say a couple ideas we've had in our board are sort of events. Um, sometimes they're live events. Sometimes they're like right now we have a backyard bird count going on. <laughs> um, or they did a, a live field trip kind of event where you, you know, so you are watching somebody do it or you're doing the same thing at the same time. So I'm kind of curious what other ideas people have as well, Carly. Anybody had any great luck with this that wants to reading contests? Love that. Yeah, me too. Contests, valuable prizes, yes. Yeah, if your students are really connected on social media, like Instagram has been a big one for our board anyways, all of our 16 high schools are 17, if you include Alt Ed, are active on Instagram doing the things that Jen said, like the, the bird hunts uh, and the I think there was like a find the largest tree in the Kitchener Waterloo. Yeah, region. trees that trees that look like scary monsters. Monster yeah. trees. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a virtual spirit days have been really big as well. Um, and then those uh, our our board is still running extracurriculars um, via um, Google Meet. So we have really active um, African Caribbean Black. Um, society groups that are running that do virtual speaker series. We have um, an anti-Asian racism group running at our school. We have an eSports. I will tell you about eSports. Uh, they came to me and I said, oh yeah, I'll help you figure it out. Well, who knew it was an entire underground, not underground, above ground community that's, yeah, I didn't know this. In my and, upstairs bedroom, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I know a lot more about it now. It's a hugely active community and we are actually playing BC in the finals in a couple of days, a school out in BC with our esports club, which has been a really good one. 
Um, Amanda saying here, uh, we did a Rube, oh, the, is it Rube Gold, uh, Goldberg machine Gork. contest? Is that where you th do the marble or the yeah, ball? Yeah, yeah, or ping pong balls or pick your, yeah. Really cool. And then, yeah, Google Padlets uh, or Google Slides and Padlets to showcase student work. All of those, I mean, th the problem is we cannot, we're only as connected as the students want to be. So it's, it's providing the multiple entry points for students uh, to engage in finding things like that might not, you know, those kind of off market opportunities for kids that might not want to do like a push up contest or, you know, a cake baking contest and offering like a huge variety, which takes a lot of work and energy, but can have a really great payoff when kids are, are buying in. All right, I'm not seeing anything uh, else in the chat. We have about five minutes left. Just wondering if there were any last questions, comments, thoughts. Poetry. Oh, poetry. I think all these, these artistic expressions, I gotta say, Carly, have been so valuable and um, really fit some kind of need for students and the staff working with them. Like those, those, poetry contests, um, you know, the music, um, setting art to music. I, I've just been really impressed how people have been, students in particular, have been able to not only form community and feel more connected to each other, but process their emotions through those projects. So I think that you really, people are really onto something with those kind of, of expressions, it, synchronously or asynchronously. And I would just say again, a pitch for um, a pitch for sitting down with your team. Like if you're a teacher, you know, um, engaging your administration in some of these ideas, or if you're an administrator or a consultant, you know, it, finding a team of people and and sitting down and doing some brainstorming work to try and um, pre-plan these things because the more effort that you can put in, the more you can kind of front load your work, the better it is. And then that frees you up for that valuable time connecting and engaging. Derek, I can, uh, you're asking about the eSports League. If you want my emails on there, if you want to send me an email, I can send you some information that I, uh, that I found. A teacher asked me, actually a student, a very articulate student who's very well versed in eSports e came with a proposal and then we had to find a teacher and then it spiraled into me investigating all of the esports across Canada. So I'm happy Carly, to share. Carly, if you have email. LED lights and a fancy chair, now you're you're part of the team. I know. <laughs> Sorry, I was just I was just wondering, is that something that the school hosts, or did you just sort of like put the word out there and they sort of gathered outside of school time or no no the kids yeah so the kids uh they we put it out on um like our normal channels for students to sign up like it's a club it's called the esports club there are um 65 participants right now um yeah 110 had signed up uh, and then we have used an outside company that's offering free, like free, obviously they're capitalizing to hook us for next year, but free um, membership. So all of our students have this membership in this esports hosting site. And then they, through the site, set up tournaments with um, PG 13 rated games <laughs> across okay. uh, the, the uh, country. So the kids do it from home. They are on a couple different communication platforms. And then uh, Joe, our teacher who runs it is in a Google meet and acts as a, like a touch point and kids can pop in and out as they're doing the tournaments. So all run virtually, usually between 2.30 and 4.30 after school. Okay, thanks. Oh. I may send you an email still. Sure. And then I'll forward it right to Joe. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's kind of it for our time together. Um, Cardi has our, um, our information on the last slide. Feel free to email us for anything. Any of, if you want to see any of the artifacts that we've developed in the distance learning um, school that I'm involved in, I'm happy to pass on examples or samples of a variety of things. Um, and uh, I, 
Carly as well has so many ideas when it comes to instruction and particularly blended learning instruction. So thanks so much for your time. We are a small but mighty group and I, I learned a few things here. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with uh, that learning from my perspective. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks you guys. Bye everyone. Have Bye. a good day. <clears throat>